Is there any additions or deletions? Thank you, Mars. Call for the question on the agenda. Those in favor? Opposed? Carried? Confirmation of the minutes of April 8th uh, Ag Service Board meeting. Klaus? I'll move the minutes of uh, the April 8th. Okay, thank you, Klaus. If nothing, I'll call for the question. Those in favor? Carried. And Gary, your report for uh, Supervisor of Agri Services report? Yes, we'll get right into that. Uh, first, we'd like to uh, welcome Alan Afatha. So, Alan, uh, uh, maybe you could explain uh, your new role. We used to have the key contact when uh, folks from the Alberta government would come to our meetings. There's a new role. I think it's called the Regional Liais Liaison Member, if that's right. So Alan will be here to observe our meetings like we have in the past. And then if there's any questions as we go through, if we could just save them for the end for Alan and maybe he can add some, some uh, clarity from the provincial government. So welcome, Alan. Okay, welcome and good morning, Alan. Thank you. All right, getting into my report. Uh, we'll just go through as usual. And if there's any questions, just stop and we can have a, a discussion on whatever you want to. So, um, the Egg Service Board grant, um, very surprised. We got our payment in June this year. Uh, our new amount is 123000 for the legislative stream uh, resource management, 91000 And uh, we also got a payment from uh, last year for the 91000 So uh, moving forward, we got, a, we got our set amounts. Uh, mowing, oh, the for first cut of mowing is complete and we're, we're well into the second round. It's been uh, a fairly easy year on mowing. Just the second round is we're mowing a lot of kosher weed and cleaning up that as part of our, our vegetation management program. Uh, normally we'll send out a disc mower into you know West Barrens and some of the dryland country. We did not do that this year. Uh, just because of the fire risk with that type of mower. So everything is being done with triple gangs, which uh, takes a little longer. And that disc mower, it, it helped save on costs. So uh, mowing's going quite good and it's, it's looking, uh, looking good on the second pass. Not a lot of uh, regrowth as you could imagine. Hamlets and subdivisions, uh, same thing. Going through one second pass, uh, a fairly easy, a light amount. And they, they look quite good with that little bit of rain we had. Uh, mowing also being done for weed control in areas where we can't spray. Um, a little less of that this year. Uh, normally we go to where there's been road construction and shoulder poles, so a little less of that work. Creates a little less work for us with all the weeds that come in with the, the, the seeded grass as well. So, uh, Weed control. Uh, most of the roadside spraying done in uh, divisions 4, 5, and 6 this year, and that was our spray zone area. We have uh, not done as much spraying. Uh, what I'm trying to say is we've done a lot of spraying this year because of the kosher that comes up on the edge of the road. We have uh, more miles uh, than a long time and we're using mainly contact herbicides just because uh, some of the ones that uh, have the residual will stick around too long in a drought and we don't want to have that uh, risk of moving off target. So. Uh, custom spray work, uh, we completed that in July. We caught that after we had a little bit of rain. So we did use some residual herbicides there and sending out the bale here right away and it's right around the 28,000. That is our normal amount. Uh, they haven't cut uh, that funding. Uh, where they have seen the cut is the mowing. So uh, they're only doing one cut in most areas. They, they have double cut. Uh, between Colville and Lethbridge, we've asked them to cut the jail road just because it's difficult for us to spray. Um, we're no noticing the weeds are coming on the highways. I mean, if you're driving up and down the road, you can see that, right? So uh, with them, we, we, we run the program for them just like we do our own program. We, we set a, uh, roads that we want to spray each, uh, each year. 
uh, kind of move around so every there's control in all areas and then we work with them on doing a little bit of additional spraying sometimes or or mowing so uh, weed inspections uh, it's been ongoing and there's been a number of, of uh, weed notices this year I think there's been four uh, road top vegetation control trucks so what we're doing here is we're controlling weeds on top of the road and that is the main area we, we, we have weeds in and this has been our most successful program we're using a herbicide that's pre-emergent so we're able to get it down in May and uh, we spray it with Roundup or something that's contact as well and it's working incredibly well we're going to increase the amount of roads we increase the amount this year and uh, we hope to use it some uh, on some of our road out in the ditch a little bit further just to get some more control mainly we're dealing with kosher on top of the road so the greater guys like it yet uh, they don't have to get to the edge of the road and, and uh, deal with the, the excess vegetation as, as much and as soon as we're done mowing they're in there doing their shoulder work so a uh, bottle control. So we had some bottle control releases. The only uh, agent they're they're uh, releasing right now is for leafy spurge. I think COVID kind of hurt their uh, planning a little bit. So uh, monitoring those um, Alberta Invasive Plants Council are the ones that uh, give us the release, and they come out and there's a couple of uh, ladies this year, and uh, they were monitoring uh, past performance. Uh, the leafy spurge agents are working incredibly well this year and i think the reason is, is is the dry they must do well in the dry conditions um they're just they're uh, really they're, the amount of beetles found is incredible so and also in the past we put uh, nap weed agents as well uh, mainly along the river system and and uh, they're working well as as well uh, i'll give you a, a case point here uh, one of our weed inspectors was traveling through, through Nobleford and they found a napweed plant which is very unusual to find one there. One napweed plant he found and it was covered in biocontrol agents. Our closest biocontrol agent release site was in the Colhurst area so they're, they're moving on their own and we're going to continue uh, with that program and we're spreading along and uh, covering the whole county residents really like it because there's not a lot you can do with with leafy spurge it's it's difficult to control with spray and lots of people don't want to use herbicide along the river system and, and they shouldn't be probably either so i'm moving on to pest control uh grasshoppers uh, uh you've all seen the news reports from lethbridge uh there are definitely some hot spots in the county but surprisingly there's also places where you're not finding a lot of grasshoppers um west lethbridge I think things have settled down there and it, I mean there's the, the grasshoppers I believe what I'm hearing got disease and the and the once the crops are off as well so another hot spot was uh Sundal area uh I went out into a field and it, it's incredible when you haven't seen a uh, grasshopper problem for for 20 <laughs> 25 years they're eating the heads right off eating the grain it's it's uh you know interesting to see that again and we we don't we don't hope that does not continue that but i mean if the drought stays with us we're going to continue to see grasshopper uh, issues uh, i talked to a farmer in that turn area and they sprayed and uh they used a couple different herbicides and the next day they come back the ground was covered so they need they needed to do that there's some spraying going on uh, bacterial ring rot uh that's the potato fields uh, no suspect plants found we we were looking at nine fields this year that's an increase normally we're in the thought well we've got staff that's been trained so you look for some wilting of the plant and then you, you take off a cutting and you kind of squeeze it with a pair of pliers and you'll see uh pussy material come out it's difficult to identify so if we find something that we think is a problem we'll send it away for lab analysis and when it gets into the potato so if you see some plants like that you, you dig them up and then the potato will actually have a black ring in the potato and then it just uh if those are put into storage they just disintegrate and they they kind of got a pus that comes out of them and then it can affect seed potatoes and it's just uh, not something we want. We've never found it here. It has been found in southern Alberta before, though. Is 
thing that I've got about my neighbor, he uh, mm. throws that well, beautiful uh, potato rolls in his for his garden. Yeah, and, and we, if you give him a number, we can come take a look at that if he wishes to. And, yep, yep. I mean, we're not complete experts, but we can find the ones that are or, and uh, send it along to them. We work with the Potato Growers Association. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that won't be a problem. Uh, about the army worm, uh, that's carried out again this year. That's on canola, and I, I have a misprint in here. I put uh, numbers are rising slightly numbers actually drop slightly with the birth army worm so we'll have to get that corrected um well, we were told uh after our traps come down in july that there will be no issue with with birth army worm so there's not a, numbers are small um strict nine we sold 1394 bottles of strict nine this year that's down um we run out of product in mid-june we had about enough for the year and the reason a less amount here I think guys have bought extra probably last year and are still holding on to some. So we won't have that uh, to be used as a product again. And uh, they have until next year to, to go through it and use it up or else they'll have to turn it in. And I think uh, most farmers, they're going to be able to use that up. So uh, Options uh, for that, we'll have to look at, I mean, there's nothing great. Um, as part of the uh, Farmer Pesticide Certificate Program, there's an endorsement you can get for Fistoxin. So you can use Fistoxin on, on gophers. Um, I can teach that program, and, and if they have the Farmer Pesticide Certificate already, they can study and then they can come write a test at my office and they can, they can use that, that for gopher control. Uh, there's people in the county that do that, and, it, and they like it, it works good. So that's, that's the only great option i mean there's there's other ones that don't work quite as good so um a private trapper we hired for skunk and rabies detection and the focus here this year was a little bit different area we we believe the um rabies issue if there ever one will come from the east or the south and that's kind of the where we focus this year broxburn road right along the uh, old man river the reason we picked this area we got a call for uh a rat issue perhaps in a combine that was brought in from Saskatchewan. In checking out the area we found an incredible amount of skunks so we thought they might have some success there and I, I think they did. And regarding that uh, rat infestation, we visited that site at first daily and then weekly when we realized there probably wasn't a problem and we put out um, poison to control anything that was there. There was there was a lot of mice that come in and that. And, we're not sure what it was, but we're very confident it was not, not a rat infestation. So, uh, Moving on, a private contractor was hired by the Society to Prevent Dutch Elm Disease to do a survey uh, for Dutch Elm in Diamond City. So uh, the contractor came out of Saskatchewan and we learned an incredible amount about Dutch Elm from, from these guys. Um, they taught us in a course in Tabor. We went over there and, and they had a group of people that uh, taught us on Dutch Elm. It's incredible uh, the, the, what they do. In Saskatchewan right now, uh, they're finding Dutch Elm everywhere, and we don't want it here. The big concern is firewood. Firewood is expensive right now, and uh, some, you know, if you're coming back from Saskatchewan, it's, it, you, know, you can't bring it with you. But the biggest thing I learned is that if you have elm trees and you think there's a problem, and you had a problem last year, it wasn't Dutch Elm because that tree would be dead. In one year, the tree's gone. So we do get calls every once in a while. We put out information on Dutch Elm that you should uh, not prune during the pruning brand. And then my phone rings to come look at the sick elm trees. So we haven't found anything. They've also taught us how to survey. So we take a snippet off the tree and we're uh, able to send that way for analysis. And Nothing's come back. These folks, uh, they have an eye for it. They go through the community and just look at all the trees. 
They also took a look at the Barrens area. There was another survey that I got back here just recently. No Dutch elm was found. And of course, the reason we're looking so close in these areas is because Dutch elm disease was found in the city of Lethbridge. So, and uh, they go through their phone records and their other records of incidents where people have phoned and thought they had Dutch elm. That's the areas they're going to, to take a look and also where firewood has been stored. No, yeah, from my understanding, just elm trees, but all types of elm trees. I mean, the normal elms we see here are uh, American elm. Those are the nice big ones. There's also a Siberian elm. They're, they're a little bit different. They don't look uh, like your typical elm tree. And then there's other hybrids that are in, in uh, the county as well. We purchase uh, uh, Brandon elms that we put in our parks. They're, they're still a really good tree. We just have to be vigilant on keeping the Dutch elm out. Moving on to soil erosion. This has been the year of soil erosion. Uh, large scale wind events uh, created a real issue last winter. Uh, we have reminded producers of their obligations under the Soil Conservation Act through social media, the Sunny South News and public service announcements. Uh, uh, that is working very well. Uh, a group of municipalities in the south, uh, we teamed up and we contracted Farming Smarter to do some work on soil erosion. So they have put out two articles for us. Uh, you may have seen they're quoting our municipalities, our policies on, on what we do. Um, soil erosion is everybody's responsibility and we're making a lot of phone calls and uh, educating the younger producers and, and everyone else that needs information. Like we can get them information. And uh, I mean, it's very difficult to watch your land blow and especially if you don't have an answer. Uh, some of the land that was blowing was on frozen ground. They tried, a lot of people tried putting manure on that. It works somewhat, but I mean, it, the, that is not a situation that anybody wants. If they phone us, we do have solutions. There's, um, we have a, a machine that uh, can make some ridges and also we could work with our greater operators and getting into frozen soil sometimes is possible with one ripper on the back of a grader. And we've done it before, and it works. So, and you'll see more of those uh, articles coming out from Farming Smarter here over the next uh, couple weeks. The idea is to get farmers thinking about it before winter and how they leave their soil. It's already happening and already working. You're seeing uh, some of the large feeder operations that have taken off silage or seeding already. Uh, there's been growth and we're hoping by the time end of October there'll be something there to hold the soil so uh, I think that's what they're hoping as well so roads roadside seating uh, ASB crews undertake the seating and a bit of a little bit less work with that because road construction is more uh, it takes a longer process so less miles are getting done of course and if they ramp up to more shoulder pulls we'll have more work and then every time ups and downs the flows of this work it affects our other work as well and one thing to remember we're seeding all of our grass into dry land conditions in a drought uh, good luck getting grass going under these conditions so uh, we usually nor normally use a hydro seeder uh, we're putting a little we're, we're spreading it on to and putting it in with a disc just scratching lightly uh, hydro cedar will dry out on top in these drought conditions where you need something in the soil. So we're, we're doubling down on our efforts. Uh, the stuff we seeded this spring, it, it, it came up, but not as good as it should have been, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, and uh, we all seen that when the, you do roadside seeding, you know, like uh, whatever, and when it's a fairly wet uh, summer or whatever, you have uh, a good you know, population coming up. However, I've seen some dry years and it seems to maybe not come that the greatest, but the next year there is more and more coming. So that seed will sit dormant down there and then, and then germinate maybe the next year? Oh, absolutely. So we did some seeding last fall and with the dry winter, with the hydro seeder, and uh, nothing came up. And then when that rain hit here, 
month and a half ago, it germinated. So it'll sit there uh, until it gets some moisture conditions if it doesn't blow away, which you know is also a concern. But with the hydro cedar, we're putting down a tack of fire that will hold it for a year. So it stays there for a year. And uh, we always tell our guys, make sure you seed good on top because it'll always get to the bottom. So um, and just another point, when I first started with the county, it was a drought in the ni early 90s. And we were told not to look back at what you had seeded for three years. It'll come, be patient. So problem is, is that you're not really able to spray those areas because you want the grass to establish. So that's where we're sending out those mowers and doing uh, mowing work to, to keep them so people aren't uh, having weed concerns there, so. Uh, equipment rental, brewing and drill rental, uh, been very steady. Uh, I put this report in a while back. Um, up to date numbers are, I think 33 users with about $5,000 in revenue. Um, these drills are paying for themselves. We have two, they are very busy in the spring and we are getting calls every day. We'll put it out on social media or in a newsletter and uh, phone starts ringing. So we wanna keep these, the last set of drills we had were 25 years old and it was a high maintenance. With these making uh, good value, we may be looking at replacing it earlier just so people have a reliable piece of equipment. Plastic baler use, um, that has incre increased uh, a lot over the last years and that's just uh, with some of the programs that are being run by clean farms and we're lucky to have DBS Environmental that's working with us at the transfer stations too. They will use our bag roller to re-roll bags. They're, they're doing what it takes and I, I won't go into this too much because clean farms is here today to do a, a presentation on that. Skunk, raccoon, and magpie trap usage. Uh, same thing, we put this out on social media and the next thing you know, all of our traps are out. Um, constantly people phoning for magpie traps. Uh, skunk traps a little bit less, uh, but they're, they're, they're always in, in demand. So we'll have to make a few more this winter. Uh, parks. Playground, uh, yard maintenance, and all the mowing we do with the, with the parks crew. Um, obviously, in our dryland parks there in July, there wasn't a lot to mow. Same thing, weeds would come back. Uh, we kept them as nice as we could. The rain greened things up, but a much less effort was needed this year. So we've taken that effort and we're planting trees. Uh, we've put a lot of trees in our parks in the last five years. Lots of feedback from citizens that they enjoy the, the trees that we're planting and we're uh, to keep those trees alive, it's taken a lot of effort with uh, watering. Uh, we also were able to put in some parks amenities. Uh, we're putting in uh, picnic tables and uh, garbage bins and the odd small play equipment. So that's we're getting lots of good feedback on that. And then um, we also have the uh, grant we have for the Monarch Playground. Uh, we're obligated for some money to put there. Well, we've been working with them. It's going a little bit slower than we ha would have liked. So they have to put in an application to become a nonprofit organization and it's just taking longer than they would, would have liked as well. So th what they're doing is um, getting that done so we can apply, they can apply for a provincial grant, which will enhance that, that park even more. So that right now they're going through trying to get that application in. Uh, cemeteries, uh, we're mowed and weed whipped twice. The second uh, round of doing that was uh, a little bit more weed whipping than around the gravestones than anything else. There was, those are our driest areas where, th where those graveyards are located. Gary, has Monarch, uh, did they start a new society or something for the playground? Is that, yeah, that what they need to apply they for They didn't then? have one that they could go through. So yeah, so they, they're creating that right now. And time is uh, not on their favor for next year because you need to get that uh, those in, those applications in right away, I would say before December if you want to get a project done next year. So that might push it back another year or till the end of last year. Ideally, when we're, we're dealing with these uh, community associations, we like to put in playgrounds in the spring 
and kids are using them and you see the value putting a playground in in September is not nearly as ideal right so. and then upcoming we have uh, through the budget allotted the next uh, uh, community that we work will will likely be Shaughnessy in uh, 23 so we may have some back-to-back -back projects and I'll start working with them this winter with the uh, you work with the community associations yep we we do and we get them uh going on the, the county is given some money and and we, we work we meet with them and we create relationships with them uh we let them we, we set them up with the, our contacts for playground e equipment uh, there's some good ones in the county uh, we tell them what we would like and then they can pick what they like so when they're able to pick the all the amenities they like you know that was their decision if it doesn't get used if it doesn't put that on myself I, i'm not you know i'm not a child or a parent of a, of a young child so i don't know what's perfect for them so they like doing that keep it going any more questions on playgrounds or anything like that okay we did a yeah, five thousand dollar donation to the farm safety center as we always do through the the ASB budget I haven't got the numbers back on on kids they have reached out to uh, was, they were going to an online format and some in person I believe that report will come later on uh, the farm family that's been really a stalled out deal with the Calgary Stampede not going in full fashion so the Slump family they hold that nomination until until it is presented we had uh, planned to form a pesticide course and we had worked it out with uh, Bill Hammond as we always do. We work in coordination with him. Uh, we promoted, uh, nobody signed up, whether they didn't want to do the online or, or whatever. We had one person from the county and one other person, so we, we just, we didn't have it. And we reached out, you know, to that person that they can come and they can do it correspondence wise and then come right to test at my office as well so we've done a number of these courses over the last five years maybe we've caught up a little bit we'll continue to try try to have them but if there's you know, maybe we're caught up and that'll be cycled through in another five years so up next uh, resource management stream so this stream of funding uh, the work here was done by a, a a young individual we have at the county, Matthew Wells, and he's done a, a great job of digging into this. And he has a great, uh, he's inspired to do some good work. So I'll go through what he has provided me. And this report was put in a while ago as well. So there's some updates I'll touch on as well. Uh, the county newsletter. So we, we rebranded the newsletter and we called it Rural Living and Egg Extension. And that one come out in March, the first one. We're working on another one. We work kind of out with a committee, myself, Matthew, uh, Derek Vance, and uh, the communications department on putting this out. Uh, the idea here, uh, it went from solely nutrient management. Uh, we, we put other things in there to grab people that would want to read it and then put in all the other stuff that we are required to, that, you know, the cap funding and environmental farm plans. And so we have a mix. Uh, the feedback they got it was very w well received in the community so the next one's going to be similar and uh, we're uh, excited to see uh, reaching out to more uh, people in the community so Matt, Matt's meeting a lot of people and it, that's great for uh, uh, putting out ag information. Floating Islands and this is uh, something that just come to us uh, some uh, folks in the county donated some of these floating islands and the idea here is uh, it cleans up the stormwater wastewater so we've got four that were donated we purchased the plants and they're in Broxburn if you're ever by there the plants are doing good uh, studies are showing that these do work we're going to be putting a bunch more of these in in the fall here to give it a chance and and we're going to showcase to producers and people in the county that this may be an option to chemical control this was put out on social media as a post and it is the largest post the county's had on on people who viewed it, it was in the between 100 and 200 people viewed the post Thank you. 
Yeah, I would think you, you could. It's to like, kind of control the algae. I'm not an expert, but uh, this is just a, kind of a new concept. Uh, there are a ton of these in the city of Lethbridge that I went and visited and looked at. And uh, it works in conjunction. You know, at Broxburn, we got the big bubblers, and that takes a lot of uh, energy to run those to clean the water. And then you're using uh, chemicals in the past, like bluestone, that are not necessarily good for the environment. So the, the idea is to clean these, these up. And also it would work in a, in a pond like that. Uh, like I say, a study uh, is being done right now at Olds College for these. They just announced it here in the summer. So um, we tested the water prior to, and so we have a baseline data for, for the, uh, if it's working or not. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, these, it, what you use in Broxburn there, that's actually a glorified aerator? That it, the ones that are there right now are aerators. Okay. Yeah. Because most most people have those aerators in their dugouts and stuff like yeah. that too, and it and it really really helps uh, you know the, uh, the to keep the pond clean and keep it cl uh, clean of algae and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for sure. And the, the the deal with these are is that it's a larger pond. The, the Broxburn ponds actually are holding a lot of water, and uh, to make these work and give them a fair chance, we're going to need a number of them. So we may have to continue with those, or, or we may have to get, like the city is what they've got, is uh, they lay out bubblers that are kind of on the bottom of the, of the ponds, and then every so often they'll bubble to circulate the water so that those plants can then grab wh what's circulating and clean it up. So, so how big of a pond would you like? I, I, I can't answer that one. I'd have to get back to you on, on the perfect size. Okay. But uh, Matt has a, some information on that. And uh, it, for, for our area, it's going to take quite a bit. And, and they're not inexpensive, but we just want to show the options. And, and the reason so many people on social media liked it is because it's non-chemical. Yeah, because wouldn't it be a great idea to use it like uh, on the big feedlots? They have pretty, pretty big ponds where they have their water. And they use the water, and then you can see if it's uh, really working, uh, that, you know, the, that the, the drinking water for the animals gets a lot better. Yes, and that's uh, what we're going to promote. So if we have tours in the future, we'll, we'll take the tours out there and show them. And uh, Matt, when he's meeting with producers through environmental farm plants, he can mention these sorts of things to them. Uh, it's, 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 I don't know how new the concept is. I mean, the city's got them in all, a, a lot of wastewater ponds in, in drainage ponds in the city. So Moving on, informing the public. So Matt has been uh, sending out what is that weed and what is that insect. I think people uh, enjoy finding out about weeds and insects, and uh, we'll continue to do that. We'll only do it during the summer months, and that'll probably be ending right here. Um, as well, we've been putting a, a lot of information out on social media. If you guys are hooked up to Facebook and you'll notice there's a lot of ag information going out. We're, we're, we've never promoted agriculture and all the programs for the province as much. And the reason being is you can't meet in person. So that's their way of getting the information out. Uh, I think producers are, are, are liking it. Uh, we don't want to monopolize the, the county social media. And sometimes we feel like we are doing that. And uh, cap funding. Uh, that works in conjunction with the environmental farm plan. So Matt has taken the environmental farm plan training. Uh, this is a little dated. He's finished and he's already started going through environmental farm plans with producers. Uh, they're lining up, dairy producers mainly. Uh, they are required to have an environmental farm plan uh, for their association. And we've got four or five on the queue right now and Matt is getting incredibly busy with that. And he's becoming, uh, guiding them to cap funding. Like cap funding has been held back, of course, because of the financial situation of the province. But programs that are available, he's becoming uh, knowledgeable in them, and then he's leading producers to what they can get. On the uh, cap funding, that's. Uh, uh, are there? Do you have any idea how many? Uh, people are still active and because I mean they all are all uh, they're also working with the uh, the classrooms and that's actually the classroom agriculture program is that's what you're referring to isn't that correct no it's a Canadian agriculture partner partnership funding so it's it's some money that's available for certain programs uh, in cooperation with the province and the in the federal government 
So there's a website you go to, and there's plans, uh, you know, programs for watering, uh, sometimes off-stream watering, sometimes pumping during dry conditions. And it's a grant that's usually, it takes some input from the producer as well. It's not just here's a whole bunch of money. It, you, they've got to put some, some funding in as well. I, I asked them because the, uh, the, the province also has uh, a group there, and that's not connected to the government or anything like that, but the uh, uh, classroom agriculture program that they have and that they... Uh, that they go and speak there at uh, at the classroom, and I think it's grade four that they always use, and that they uh, enlighten them about the uh, about the agriculture and everything like that. That they uh, you know especially because the kids are uh, three, four, or five generations removed from from agriculture over the over the years, and uh, that way uh, we uh, we use that because I know in the dairy industry we use that for uh, for uh, trying to educate the children. Yeah, so I don't know that that's why I thought this was connected. No, there are programs like that, and we've actually uh, helped um, that organization find producers in our area that are willing to speak. And uh, the ones I went to was Egg for Life, I think it was called, and it was uh, they're running them through the Lethbridge schools. So, and there's also been programs I know in in uh, Iron Springs uh, for safety. There's a, there's a number of organizations doing work there. And, when we're contacted, we always find them producers, and there's always guys willing to promote agriculture. So he's got down here beetle drops. So that's uh, in con coordination with the, the drops we did uh, elsewhere. What we're doing is working with the Old Man Watershed Mainstream Group, and we're working with them and uh, providing them with a couple beetle drops where they want. Just gives us a connection to them. Um, so the crop reporting he's doing as well once a month uh, agroclimatic uh, reporting as well on, on weather uh, he helps set up the water sites and we still have our riparian area down on the little bow and uh, we're going to keep that and the reason being uh, we've got um, cows and fish came down there and they had a field day where they're training their staff and individuals uh, we've got two college classes that are coming in uh, Next week, I guess it'll be uh, two consecutive days, classes of thirty or forty, and they're doing. Uh, they don't have to speak; they have the knowledge. They're just using that that land as a showcase. So um, it, it's working very well, and, and we're maintaining that. And it certainly shows the benefits of uh, off-stream watering systems. Uh, just more to note with this: uh, we've been asked to speak at the college in November me and Matt will go to the college and, and we'll do a presentation on um, the Weed Control Act the um, environmental farm plans Matt can do that that as well but they want uh, enforcement uh, soil erosion and uh, and pest control as well so we'll, we'll show them the last uh, meeting we had was a presentation on the Weed Control Act and I'll take that one and Maybe each each time we're invited, we'll we'll reach out and do something different. So we also have a field day that's coming up uh, with the uh, Old Man Mainstream Group. So uh, next Friday we're having a field day where we've invited folks from along the river and part of that group, as well as other areas of the county. Uh, Cows and Fish is coming. They're going to speak about uh, some of the programs and grants that may be available. Uh, Old Man Watershed will be, Council will be there as well, and uh, the lady that from the Alberta Invasive Species Council is going to be there as, as well. So there's going to be, we're going to talk about, uh, it's an outdoor event, environmental farm plans, like I said, uh, cap funding opportunities, so just a brochure that we've got here, off-stream waters. It's a great way to bring people together and uh, start thinking about riparian health. So... That's uh, kind of an exciting we event we have for next week. I think we've got around 20 people lined up. And that should cover my report. Uh, we do have one more thing I'd like to talk about, and that is uh, de declaring an ag disaster. So um, after last council meeting, uh, I watched, and, and I've got some points here uh, of, of maybe questions that uh, need a little more uh, clarification. So declaring ag disaster at the municipal level, it does not trigger or exclude any uh, uh, producers from any funding options. That's what we're told. However, I mean, everybody's nervous that you're, if you don't declare a disaster that you're not fully covering your folks. Everybody feels the same way. I've talked to all the 
ag fieldmen that are connected to Lethbridge County and many many have already declared a disaster and everybody's nervous they're not going to help their their producers to the extent they need to uh, municipal declarations that that's to bring attention to the drought situation and support our affected producers so certainly there are a lot of producers in Lethbridge County that are affected by drought dry land guys dry pastures the cattle producers and many other situations that certainly meet the criteria of a disaster situation uh, the army guide I've gone through that a whole bunch of times it does not fit well for our situation in Lethbridge County because we're irrigated but we still have people that are in a dire situation I mean I'm sure we all know neighbors cattle feed is tough to, tough to get and uh, just a, a tough situation for some so a provincial declaration now that could bring additional support but a, a declaration a full declaration by the province that goes off data so they're going to wait and see likely what actually is happening out there they're investigating the cattle issues and uh, programs have been announced already so uh, the Alberta government they do have a website on farming and dry conditions Google that it'll it'll come up all the programs and current up-to-date information so yesterday it was announced uh, agri recovery is, the, is, the, is what they're calling it the program for cattle producers where they're getting the two hundred dollars a head uh, that's been announced a while back but I think yesterday was the first day you could start filling out those applications and for talking to the cattle guys that first uh, hundred or ninety four dollars will come quite quickly by the end of September the other one you're gonna have to prove that you're in a, in a feed shortage I believe yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Gary you were talking about you know cattle producers I I think this is mainly focused on cow calf operation right yes I believe so yes yeah, yeah. thank you mr. chair so Gary the one question I've been asked is by not if you do have a state of disaster is it considered to be better for you applying for a tax deferral if you have to sell your cows have you heard anything about that I, I have not okay and w the point here too there's no harm in, in declaring an ag disaster to support your producers the AMA guide is a guide uh, I've talked to the, there's a group uh, called the Provincial Drought Excessive Moisture Advisory Group. They brought it in a few years ago. It was actually for excessive moisture, the problems they were having. So I think in 2015, there was a lot of droughts declared. So they wanted to have a, a set way of handling these situations. Um, it's not a perfect guide. I, I don't know how much consideration went into to the irrigated areas. So it, it's difficult. Yeah, uh, talking about this one, I mean, there's uh, a lot of people in the irrigated areas that do not have sufficient land for the amount of uh, animals that they have. Uh, it's like the agriculture disaster program, would that uh, also, uh, like, would that be for them also if they, well, a lot of them have to buy f a lot of feed. Yeah. And then the feed that they would have to buy would be a lot more money, of course. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, are these... Uh, or, or uh, are these covered by that or you don't have any idea about I, I don't know on that but one thing to note is that a uh, high price there's double-edged sword to high prices some people are benefiting from the high prices and others that are obviously hurt I mean if you're having to buy a lot of feed and I don't know how far two hundred dollars goes in feeding animals I, d I wouldn't think that far yeah, because that, al that also uh, includes uh, all the grain prices and everything of course too that uh, that everybody needs and even uh, like the, the the feedlots and everything like that yeah that they're paying a lot more money for the grain yeah from my understanding if you're you're the there's programs available that the, the crop insurance programs is going to be the main thing for the uh, the producers so I if they're covered by insurance then maybe they can pick up some some of that their lost lost money but yeah a lot is familiar on on that part of the high the high prices affecting large feeding operations so so oh, there was a declaration made a uh, motion made last council meeting so that the next step here is to write a letter to the Minister of Agriculture and copy our MLA MP and the, that provincial drought 
an excessive moisture advisory committee as well as sending this information out to all, all ag service boards over the last two months uh, they're coming in every day i'm getting the emails from all the the ag service boards that have declared a disaster there are i believe 69 ag service boards in the province i would say over 30 now are in a disaster situation right around there Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if you have an answer for that, Gary, or not, you know, but our neighboring municipalities, they having that disaster uh, application for drought in place for quite a while already, and we, ha we haven't yet. Well, uh, why is that? Yeah, that's a council's decision if they want to declare a disaster, and then it, just the RMA guide uh, is not... 60% of your, your crops, cereals, have to be in poor condition. Uh, reading the crop reports, we don't necessarily meet that in our area with the irrigated areas. The yeah. County of Lethbridge, as far as I know, has never declared an agriculture disaster till now. So there's no hur hurry in, in declaring a disaster either. Uh, the benefit of waiting till now is now you know what you're getting. Uh, people were out in their fields in July. I mean, the first disasters were coming in the beginning of July they didn't know what the outcome would be now there's the benefit of knowing exactly what producers have yeah, it doesn't have no effect anyways if, uh, you know if we're, we're the municipalities what haven't applied yet or are complied yet if one of one of the two down there they're going to be included anyways if it is going to be a disaster uh, funding available so it is more of a formality than anything else i guess eh? it's just a way of promoting what farmers are going through right now at the municipal level it, it has no basis when all all programs are run off data what is actually happening that can be a little bit difficult when you pass your situations i mean it does you know you go up in the north end of the county and at Sundall area and the pastures out there it's it you just glance once and you know they're in a disaster yeah in other areas too with the dryland farming's yields are I'm here you know stuff is not getting combined in the monarch area I mean you're usually pretty good in that area and then down south too there's areas where yields are easily meeting the threshold of, of, of being a disaster in the dryland areas Yep, and then so with the letters to to the uh, mentioned organizations, it's also what some municipalities has done is done a media release. Uh, with the media release, and you're really you're you know really exposing that, and then there are going to be uh, media inquiries as well to that. I I don't know some have done without a media release and just sent the letter of declaration. Others have done the full full media. It depends how much attention you want to bring to the situation. I got one more question for you. And do you know if uh, Alberta Transportation uh, is really cutting back on the mowing and everything? Because I on, on some main highways, like the 519, where we're at and stuff like that, they haven't come by yet. Yeah, so I, in talking with Alberta Transportation, their intention was to mow roads only one time this year. So what we're seeing with our mowers, now is the perfect time if you're only doing one pass. Uh, one, there's been a lot of weeds come through. Uh, that's our biggest issue, but it's a tough situation. And if you're ever going to do one cut, th this, was, this was the year. Gary, do we need a... Dis a decision today on something on the agricultural disaster okay 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 well thank you for your report Gary always just as informative as ever and lots of lots of great updates you've had so thank you any questions or comments Tori <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, just maybe touching on the, the soil erosion stuff. I know, um, you know, when it was happening last winter when we were seeing it, I, I do think that the, the county being vocal about it, I, I think that did, um, that did make an impression on people. I think, I know I talked to people in my area and they're like, the county's putting this out on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, you know, there's articles in the paper. Like, I think it, it did give some weight to it. I think everybody, we all saw it happening. Um, you know, some of it was, uh, it was just the perfect storm in the sense that, you know, with the winter we had, the, the freeze, the, the thaw, um, the amount of wind we had, the lack of residue that some people deal with. Um, I think the evolution of some of the crops we grow and some of the practices we have, like it, it really was a perfect storm last year. And I think, I do think that it, it did help. It, it, um, it made people realize that, you know, maybe it's, I think people felt ashamed. Some people did. You, you hate to see that blowing away. It's that, that's your, your revenue generator blowing away. So I think it did make an impact. And I think we did see a lot of people out there trying to do something, even if, if it was just trying, um, trying to make ridges, uh, trying to rip, uh, throwing manure on. Uh, so I, I think that was encouraging to see, but I also think from that, um, it's encouraged people to maybe look at a little bit differently this year. Like I've already seen, um, people taking off dry beans. Um, you know, they go in with a one step and windrow the beans and in between the bean rows, they're, uh, they're putting in rye grass or a, a bushel of barley or, or something like that, or a cover crop. Um, I know the local retailers that I've spoken to have, have, have had quite a bit of interest in bringing in cover crops, um, booking floaters, booking spreaders for when the, the potatoes, the beans that come off, um, so they can go blow something on. So I, I do think that, um, you did bring awareness to that. And I think that's really important that, w that we, um, keep, keep on that. Like we can't stop. We need to keep putting that message out there, um, making information available. So I think that's great. And as well, I, I really like uh, what Matthew's done. Like I thought that letter, the newsletter was great. Like you said, uh, you know, shift away just from the nutrient management. I, I felt that kind of got a little repetitive, especially if you weren't a, a, a cattle producer and you weren't dealing with manure, it was kind of a glance at it, throw away maybe a little bit, but I felt like this was a lot more fulsome and that it still had some of those elements in it, but it was much broader based. And, and like you noted, I had people texting me asking about those islands because they'd seen it on Facebook or I believe there was a Sunny South article or so it's kind of cool. It's, it's not, you know, maybe it's not a, an intentional focus of what the county does, but I think it was a great example of, you know, bringing some positive press and, and maybe a little different from the, the norm. So I was really, um, I was really happy to see that and, and was happy that it got the traction that it did. So thank you to you and your staff for that. Yeah, and, and we've got something good going here. There's a good feeling. And one of the, the best things we can do to, to promote agriculture is putting producers in there. Uh, the two producers, that'll be something that we hit on every time. Uh, we had Shaughnessy Greenhouses and then the, the Bison Company. Uh, they were just stoked. They wanted uh, in Broxburn Vegetable that did the, the gardening tips. So, yeah, well received on, on information, not just for producers, but also acreage owners and, and rural living. So uh, going back to the soil erosion, um, it's not a fun thing to do to have to promote and and to you know it's gut wrenching sometimes to have to go tell producers they got to do something and now or we're going to do it for you but uh, uh, by being proactive uh, yeah, I think it has saved the county money there is a municipality that didn't do much and uh, they are uh, when all summer cleaning out ditches I mean it was worse in some areas they spent between a half a million and a million dollars cleaning out culverts and ditches. Uh, I assessed the situation when everything was done. Uh, there may have been 10 culverts affected in the county. I give them to the Public Works Department to take care of when they go by. Uh, with blow dirt, uh, it always looks worse than it is in the ditch. When its culvert is covered, the first time a hard rain comes, it sinks to halfway down. So it, it's, it's not as bad as it looks, but we, we don't want to do that twice and then you're, you're fully covered in, in causing drainage issues. Any more questions or comments for Gary? Morris, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, no 
problem. So move the uh, Supervisor Agriculture Services report for information. Any questions? Call for the question. Those in favor? Carried. And moving down to appointments, we have Clean Farms Agriculture Plastics Recycling. I have a presentation from two representatives. Welcome. We can start by introducing ourselves. I'm Steve Campbell, the chair of the Egg Service Board. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, so I'm Davin Johnson. I'm the Alberta Program Advisor for Clean Farms. I'm actually, I live in West Lethbridge in Copperwood. I was supposed to be in Bonneville today for uh, the Alberta Care Conference, which is a conference for um, all the, I guess, the, the waste commissions and whatnot. They do their in-service training. But Friday it was cancelled just due to the new uh, restrictions that come into the province. There was supposed to be a lot of people there and a, a training and whatnot. So I was able to make it today. Tammy was here on my behalf. She's come into town to do a waste audit actually on one of our programs that we'll talk to you about. She is based out of Moose Jaw and is our Western Program Coordinator. Um, so we're going to tag team it, might as well, but this was originally supposed to be me coming to chat with you guys, but she has a lot of valuable stuff to chat about. So. Just to give you a quick overview of Clean Farms, for those of you who don't know, we're an uh, industry-led and funded stewardship organization. So we are primarily funded by industry, apart from our pilot programs where we have funding from provincial, federal government, um, and some other organizations. You'll notice a lot of those logos there are familiar to, to you. These are our members right now, 70 plus of them, that represent all sections of agriculture. Um, so essentially what we do is primarily ag plastic recycling but as well ag wastes that are non or non-organic wastes. Um, farmers use these products, they bring them to a form of collection site whether it's a municipal transfer station or landfill or to a retailer and then depending on that product we organize the management of getting it to uh, end markets so a recycling facility or safe disposal. A very brief program history um, most folks in here would be familiar with the pesticide container 1989 that started in Alberta that was actually started by the province um, and that's the empty small containers that are for collection. So they're throughout municipal sites in the province. Um, Crop Life Canada got involved in it uh, at, at that point assisting with it. We have obsolete pesticides. I'm not going to go through the whole list because you guys can have this presentation after and then give us questions just because of limited time. 2010, that's the big thing. That's when Clean Farms was formed and kind of took this over. And you'll see in the last few years, there's just a host of programs that have come online from grain bags to seed pesticide inoculant bags, um, bale wrap, silage film, twine. We're just adding to the list of materials that we recover for farmers across Canada. So in Alberta, there's six programs. We have three permanent programs and three pilot programs um, right now. The permanent programs, the under 23 liter pesticide containers, that's the one that started 31 years ago. We have totes and drums, uh, unwanted pesticide livestock equine medication. The pilot programs, so um, we're fortunate in Lethbridge because I'm here, so the very bottom one, the bale and silage film, that is only in Lethbridge County, no other place in the province. We're piloting it here just because of being able to manage it uh, and it's interesting I'll show you how we're, how we're dealing with it. Seed pesticide inoculant bags and then the grain bags and twine. So to give you a quick overview of the permanent programs, um, 
to under 23 liters. This is returned to municipal sites in Alberta. So this is the transfer stations and landfills. Um, one of the biggest things that we've added to it last year was collection bags. So previously farmers would bring them in loose to a container site. So a fenced area at the transfer station. If you go out to Iron Springs, Noble Fruit, you'll see them. It's just a fenced area. So farmers can bring them in um, loose, but to help manage it, one of the feedback that we got was we need a better way to transport them. They're blowing out of the trucks, whatnot. So to help increase collection rates across the country, we provide these collection bags at the point of purchase at the retail in the spring, and then the farmers can fill those up with their empty containers, bring them back to the collection site. Um, and then, so again, you'll have access to this presentation where you can click on the links and it provides all further information for each of these programs. So what's in, what's out. Uh, with this program, it's pesticide and fertilizer containers. Um, what's not included? I guess things like, um, that, that wouldn't be A lot be of the dairy producers yeah. that would, you know, all their cleaners and stuff that the dairy producers would, would provide is mainly basically if it has a PCP number. Yeah. And then our drums and totes. This is a ret return to retail in the province. Um, so bringing back the, the empty drums. This is non-deposit bulk containers. So many farmers will bring back their bulk containers that they pay a deposit on because obviously they're getting the deposit back. Um, so we've just been working with uh, retailers for better communication that bringing these drums and totes back to them even though there's no deposit. Um, and it's f all of our programs are free to the, the producer. Uh, so they, for participation, um, depending on the, the program, it's either, you know, the member builds it into the price, the, the cost of the product, or there's, um, on some products, like in Saskatchewan for grain bags, there, which is a permanent program, there's an environmental handling fee at the point of purchase. Um, and then very important for us this year is the unwanted pesticide and livestock medication collection. So this is anything that's old, obsolete, registrations have been withdrawn. It's essentially like a household hazardous waste, but for agricultural chemicals, uh, commercial class chemicals. Southern Alberta is happening this October 25th to 29th. The closest locations, we rotate it. So this is on a three-year rotation. So Southern Alberta will be in another three years. It'll be 2024. Um, and they rotate to give equal participation throughout the, the province or the region. So last time, I believe, one of the locations, these are always at a retail location. I believe last time there was a UFA in Lethbridge this year, there's no spot in Lethbridge specifically. The closest is Tabor or McGrath to, you know, our county. Um, and yeah, so there's 20 sites throughout this that are very specifically chosen for low distance so that a farmer doesn't have to drive any more than I think it's 50 or 60 kilometers to access one of these sites. Um, that's the ideal range. Obviously, there's some lenience there. So anything, again, that's commercial class, um, pesticide with a PCP number, livestock medication that have the DIN numbers on them, um, and then unknown things that have been sitting in a Quonset somewhere um, that may not have a label, but ideally are agricultural related. And so again, this is free for the producers. We have a waste contractor that comes and they, they consolidate it on the site. Um, and then they're, it's taken back and bulked up and that's sent for high temperature incineration for safe disposal. For this pro, for that program too, you wanna make sure like there's, there's no pre-collection. It's, there's a clean farm tires of uh, hazardous waste collection crew that can treat any of the pesticides that are coming in as they see them. There's no pre-drop off or anything like that. So that's the day, so that's the week, that's the day at particular sites across southern Alberta. There's no pre-drop off, post-drop off, or anything like that. It's just that day. Yep. So that can be all handled um, appropriately. And so in terms of our pilot programs, these are the two big ones right now that are getting, I guess, the most press. Um, across the province, there's a three-year pilot, which um, the 
provincial government provided a million dollar in funding for. Um, this is for collecting grain bags and twine. It's led by a multi-stakeholder group called the Agricultural Plastics Recycling Group, and we operate the program. Um, we operate the permanent program for grain bags in Saskatchewan, as well as a permanent program in Manitoba for grain bags and twine. Um, and so this is held at any waste transfer site. Um, well, not any, but there's, um, on the next slide I'll show you, I can't remember the exact number because we've just added more. Um, but this gives you some numbers for the collection totals. So since we started collecting in, on October 1st, 2019 through to June 30th, shows you the volumes of what we've collected in the province and then I broke it out by the county. So um, in um, Gary's presentation, he mentioned DBS Environmental. They've been very instrumental in this across the province, not in just in the county. They they help move and collect the plastics across multiple sites and bring them to the recycling facilities. Twine, they've been helping with actually collecting at hay processors, direct pickup, not just at the collection sites. Um, and so we have 33 partners. That would be like Lethbridge County or DBS holds the, the agreement. Um, the county was going to, but they, yeah. However it worked out, DBS is, is doing it, but um, Drumheller, um, you can see on the map there. These are the partners, so the sites added, there was 20 sites added in 2019, <clears throat> then additional in 2020 and then more in 2021. We're investigating a couple more. There's 84 individual locations, which is transfer stations essentially. So we pick up grain bags at all of the 33 sites and then typically within the counties they'll collect twine at all their transfer stations and consolidate it at one location for us to pick up because um, twine it comes in in a you know a big industrial size bag that we provide the collection bags it's easy enough to throw one or two in a pickup when the the transfer station attendants going to check the different stations and bring it to a main site for us to pick up um, I'm going to let Tammy talk about this because she has the most experience with grain bags and how to prepare it properly and the issues with it just for your guys' knowledge. Yeah, I've, um, I've been in a professional agrologist in Saskatchewan for 13 years now and kind of did this grain bag thing off the side of my desk uh, for the last 11 years and then I made the transition to Clean Farm four years ago to do this basically full time. So what I really like about our job is um, you guys don't necessarily, like the, the workers, the worker bees, the front end staff don't necessarily have to worry too much about the, the programs themselves. You see the big green check mark, they, they accept that material, rolled, secured material. Once you have a, a certain amount or you need to get rid of it, um, basically you call us, we take care of the rest. So. Um, a lot of time can be spent in the recycling markets, finding end, mar end markets, shipping, handling, logistics. We handle all of that, so we do that as a full-time job. But there is some, some, some little bit of educational material, so if, you, if there's anyone who can, can take some of this back to your constituency, is rolled secured material like you see in, in the far left-hand picture. The, the one that says hand-rolled bags Dirty is not the problem. Our recyclers are, do have the equipment to handle dirt, mud, spoiled grain, those types of things. It has to be rolled and secured. Um, it, this particular picture I took from one of the collection sites in Saskatchewan, it took five and a half hours to load one semi-truck and it usually takes an hour and a half. So rolled secured material makes it quick and easy for the contractors makes it life easy for the semi-driver, makes life easy for the recyclers to unload the material, and the, the world goes around, right? Um, when it's, when it's uh, you know, excessively, you can just imagine a 300 pound piece of plastic sitting on top of another 300 pound piece of plastic, and it's like grandma's yarn. So it's very difficult for contractors to move through the material if you see any of these other, other things going on. And when you start to get other plastic, con the number one issue is other plastic contamination. So you can see in the far right hand picture, there's 
twine, net wraps, no fence, and miscellaneous other material, and it's not secured, so it's kind of all mixed in. So it's really important that anyone um, bringing in this material that it's rolled, secured. Some recyclers are particular about the size. You can, that's why we, we picked the, the beautiful uh, clean white and black uh, round bale of, of a grain bag. Some are particular about size. We're not too worried about that. Roll it, secure it, bring it into one of our collection sites and we can handle it. The wood that you see in the loose drop-offs uh, a lot of producers, if, if you're unaware of how grain bags work, they have a, you know, a, a, a mechanism that will actually fill the grain bag. It stretches like a balloon. It's one time use, and then it's cut, extracted, rolled up, and recycled. The wood, um, they usually put two pieces of wood on either end and kind of roll the ends up together like a Ziploc bag. And um, then that holds the ends together so that maybe pests or something where, you know, grain doesn't spill out. So, you know, um, this, this material actually was in the bottom of some beautifully rolled material on top. So at, the, at the, each of the collection sites, they do have to be babysat a little bit to make sure that, you know, the bad apples don't get in there and that uh, tipping fees, service fees, or any other fees are, are charged um, if there's non-program or non-properly prepared material in, in the uh, truck. I'd just like to say, so if you're speaking with any of your constituents, the biggest issue that we find in <clears throat> the county here at, at the transfer station is that they'll bring in a rolled grain bag, <clears throat> excuse me, but they've rolled it off their extractor. And the old extractors, essentially, it's the same thing as hand rolling it. So it's, it's a loose, fluffy piece of plastic. If you can imagine one of these grain bags, if you haven't seen one there, the average size is 300 feet long by 10 feet in diameter. It's a massive single-use piece of plastic. When it comes to the farm to be filled, it fits in a box that's two by four by two feet. It's very tightly compact. Rolls out to make that massive slug that you see in the field. When it's extracted, it's a big piece of plastic. If you just hand roll it manually, you end up, or if you just took a loader and squished it together, you'll fill the back of the tandem truck. And that weighs 500 pounds. So filling the back of a tandem truck weighing 500 pounds versus if you roll it into the picture of the machine rolled on the left with the proper roller, which the county has and rents out, um, you make a four by four by three foot tight bale, which weighs 500 pounds. You can put 18 tons on a semi-trailer and transport that. So it's just like any other commodity is that increasing the weight to be able to ship it efficiently and then also just Tammy mentioned the loading time. So if you can encourage your producers to use and rent the roller, which I believe there's no cost for renting the county's roller, over just using their extractor and then just kind of manhandling it and getting it to a site because that's where um, Gary said DBS has been very good. They'll actually rent the roller, DBS will, and on their own time and their, their cost, re-roll them for us so that it's manageable. Otherwise, if um, we were to come in and send a contractor who in this situation is DBS, if they aren't rolled properly, that material has to be landfilled because it's the recyclers won't handle it. They can't handle it. They, their equipment for putting it through their shredding system, it's just so hard to handle big loose pieces of plastic so that's the biggest takeaway is just trying to get your producers to rent the roller and use it mm -hmm. yeah same reason and you know the the, the rollers are actually really uh, power, powered really well um, so if I were to pull up to a roller with this loose material as long as you get the first 10 or 15 feet started it, it should be able to suck that material out and um, uh, they're very thick. It, it is all recyclable material. Like I said, it's not so much the, the dirt and the spoiled grain, um, although cleanliness is, is better than, than, um, than dirt, they can handle that. It's the contamination with other plastics and making sure it's secured. Just to put this into perspective too, the photo mm -hmm. on the right, that's one grain bag that dimensionally, it's about eight by 20 by seven feet high, that pile. That same bag could be condensed into three by four by four. So, yeah. and it's 
500 pounds. And pulled with a half ton truck and a flatbed trailer rather than a tandem. Right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, with the people I've been talking to, everybody thinks it's, it's a great idea. <coughs> it's really great, everything that you do here, but there's got to be a better way to uh, collect this stuff. And the rolling machine and everything like that, it does work, but what people are complaining about, it's an awful lot of work. And that's, that's the thing that keeps a lot of people from not recycling their plastic. And it's too bad because, I mean, it's, there's... All this other stuff goes into landfill, and that is, uh, and we've seen it at the Lethbridge landfill here too. That you know, the, uh, there's so much plastic in there that could have been done. Is there no other way to uh, have a compressor truck or something like that? Like you got the garbage trucks, but then they they compress the stuff, and that you collect the stuff that way instead of only with the roller bags, because you you probably have, like I, I would say thousands of tons more if we would have a different way of being able to collect it. It's been um, my experience the quicker it's rolled when at, on farm, the less contamination is going to happen with that bag or that material. I, if they roll it and they have to store it for a year or two even, that's fine. We prefer not to stockpile them, but uh, rolling it as as soon as that grain is extracted is the best solution to get this material to a recycling market. So, but would there not be, I'm just talking about, but we could go in a different way. If you have the smaller rollers or whatever, that a person could have the roller himself on the farm. Because yep. you've got a lot of these bigger farms. They go through a lot of plastic and they do not want to take the effort to Go pick up the uh, the roller and try to try to get that uh, the bale uh, done that way because I mean that that there's a, a very a big amount of manpower uh, involved in that and I think that that is probably the biggest uh, drawback. But if we can get it done that you can you know have smaller smaller uh, baggers or balers or whatever there is because even even balers would work probably. I mean in in smaller bales. So. <clears throat> to answer your question, it is, it's just literally about managing it when you're extracting it. So most extractors that are on the market, their, ro their roller on it rolls it loose and then they have to unroll it to get it off and then hand roll it. There's a couple new extractors that you could purchase, but who's going to buy their new extractor when they go to its you know, $180,000 piece of equipment and not everyone needs to replace it right now. Those have proper rollers on the back. Like Tammy said, if... Um, I've seen farmers that have taken a post hole auger with that the flights broke off and put that on like a PTO motor or on their skid steer and they roll it up. If you drive up to an extracted grain bag and you have the roller like the one the county has, it takes three minutes, not even, to roll that grain bag. It's like incredibly fast. Wheatland County goes and rolls every grain bag for their their residents for them. They go out to the field and roll every single one. They can do that because they have a recycler in their backyard and they can take it there and get the revenue and it offsets costs. Um, so using a hay baler, some farmers do that and it works very well. It makes a very dense, bigger bales if they put multiple through, um, but that's acceptable. The thing is, for us, it doesn't have to be on that specific roller, just densified in some form. So yes, like you're saying, some form of a compactor. The issue a bit with the compactors, um, so like DBS or other waste management companies have a, a baler, like a cardboard baler. They can put pieces of silage plastic in there and it compresses it very well densely and it ties it off with steel twines when it gets to the recycler and they cut those twines there's so much pressure that it goes and they have a massive explosion of pieces of plastic everywhere if it was one grain bag the the difficulty in feeding one bag through there is incredibly tough which is why the solution that's started in Saskatchewan is a roller it's it's been tested as the most effective way to densify it and as quickly as possible. So like if you have a mess like this, it will take time. Yep. But that's the idea is to deal with it as, as you're extracting the grain, you know, maybe in threes or fours, rather than bringing it all to the farm, 
piling it up and then dealing with it, yeah, it's going to take a lot of time. And um, diesel's expensive, so a lot of people don't diesel on these to burn them, and it's not a, it's not a good solution. So I think everything takes time. There is a lot of risks to disposing of it in a in a non environmentally friendly manner. But I think just dealing with it one at a time, three or four at a time, is is manageable when it only takes a few yeah. minutes to roll. What what I'm can I? What, what I'm more referring to is like, you got the, the we got feedlot alley here, mm -hmm. and there's so much plastic uh, being wasted and going to the landfill, and, that, and that's what I was ha hammering on, trying to solve that problem that people will make it as easy as possible for these people to be able to recycle their plastic. That's coming up in the next slides, oh, okay. that plastic. Yeah. That's a separate type of plastic that looks the same, but it's just managed differently. So, fine, we can quickly say that. Yeah, basically twine only. Uh, net wrap is different plastic. It's typically made out of high density polyethylene. Twine is polypropylene. So basically if it looks different, it needs to be kept separate. So I, I usually joke around and say, I don't care if it's a Ziploc bag of twine, it's the process, right? So getting that twine to the bag, to the recycler is, is an important process. And what's really cool about twine is Alberta is in a unique position where you guys produce more twine than anywhere else in Western Canada, and then you create that balance for the rest of Western Canada to be able to have these programs as well. Um, Saskatchewan kind of does that with the grain bags. So we continue to supply the Alberta uh, recycling facilities with grain bags, just like Alberta is going to be able to supply the recycling facilities with twine. If I want a steak tonight, from a farm, I probably should have ordered my cow six months ago, right? It's the same, you know, with every type of a processing of a commodity, they need truckloads of this stuff. If I call them up and say, I'll have a truckload of twine next year, they'll be like, eh, don't bother. So when we have a consistent feedstock into a recycler, then we can continue to build the program. So um, twine, twine only, try and reduce the amount of of hay um, or straw or anything or manure or you know snow and ice uh, there's actually holes in the bottoms of the bag to drain the uh, snow and ice if it gets nice and warm in there and it can just drain out so um, go ahead yeah just some more photos ugly there. pictures <laughs> of, of what we do get um, it is actually fairly easy to sort out we me and uh, another person uh, two other people sorted out 10 tons of net wrap and twine all smushed together in a day. So um, it was really good. It's, it's just a matter of keeping it separate and we don't have a program for net wrap, but, and I know that's a major concern, but we can do twine. And just high volume twine users, just a nice story for our county is there's three hay processors that feed a lot of twine to the program, helping create that volume and the com um, the economy of scale. I'm just behind you here. Oh, yeah, no worries. <coughs> and um, uh, mainly I want to touch on seed pesticide and inoculant bags. This is a pilot. Um, 45 sites were in uh, the you know south central region of Alberta. The entire province is going to be covered in 2022 for that season. The entire province of Saskatchewan and Manitoba are also on board. And um, once again, DBS is our contractor for this. Small bags are bagged. Large bulk totes are bundled together in fives and sixes, basically in some sort of manageable form so that they can throw it onto a truck. Um, this is all returned to egg retail and um, for only seed, pesticide, and inoculant bags. We are working with some private industry to um, bring up that economy of scale, but we're hoping that the transition is, is just as smooth as Eastern Canada that's been running for five years now. And the last program, pilot program, so this is um, federal funding for bale wrap and silage plastic because you said it, feedlot alley, uh, we have a lot of silage plastic, a lot of dairies in the county, so a lot of bale wrap. Silage film is essentially the same type of plastic as a grain bag. It's just managed differently. So silage plastic will cover a bunker of feed just on the top, or it'll be a tube like a grain bag with the, the feed in it. 
However, it's not like grain bags. They're cut open and extracted and you still have one massive sheet of plastic. With silage film, the farm will cut off uh, a section to expose the front face of the, the bunker of feed to feed their animals that week or two weeks. Just enough for that. So you end up with four to 12 foot wide strips that are 20 to 150 feet long. This is the problem where you stick it in a manual baler, tighten it up. It's beautiful for transporting, but when it gets to a recycler and they remove the ties, it explodes and you have short pieces of plastic, which their equipment's set up to take a piece and it feeds in on a conveyor into a shredding system. So what we've been working on is, again, the issue is bulking up, densifying the plastic. That is the, the biggest challenge with any recycling program is densifying it to get enough weight to justify the trucking costs to get it to a recycling facility. So Full Circle Plastics, they're based out of Nobleford. They make dimensional lumber out of recycled plastic. They designed a baling system for us, which is used on farm, and we also have it at all the transfer sites in the county. DBS Environmental, because they operate the transfer stations, they've been helping operate, move material around and whatnot. Um, and so essentially, this is what it looks like. It's drill stem pipe with four walls of recycled plastic. You could do lumber with this. Um, and there's a top lid that swivels across uh, a uh, winch to lift it up and down, and there's a chain hoist used on the back, so it's manual. There's no power required. It can be put anywhere in a field, wherever a bunker is for, for feed, where that plastic is. Plastic is folded and put in there, so just a photo from the back. The chain hoist is used manually to compress the plastic. So all we're asking, farmers already, or the feedlots, what they typically do, there's three things. Um, they will fold it, roll it and take it to the transfer station, which is, we can work with that to get them to just fold it into squares, which is what we want so that you can just lay the squares in so that they compress nicely. The other thing they do is they burn it, which nobody wants happening, but I'm sure everybody's seen the black plumes in the county as, you know, typically at night, or they dig a hole and bury it um, on the farm. I've chatted with many of the very large feedlots here and they haven't really had options, and so we're testing this and seeing the feasibility of doing this. To take a piece of plastic, a silage, a, a, a piece of plastic like this, and fold it and prepare it for this machine, myself doing it on a windy day, I tested it in the worst conditions possible at Monarch Feeders. I went out there, they have one of them. I did it myself with them watching just to show them. It took me about three minutes to handle the plastic and fold it up properly and put it in the machine. What they were doing before, Monarch was really great. They were actually taking the roller that you guys have, rolling a piece, tying the next piece to it, and keep rolling. Very labor intensive to manage their plastic. They're very happy to use this to fold it and, and put it in. The biggest concern for many of the larger feedlots is the time commitment. It's gonna take us time. Normally we just take our plastic with a loader, put it in the BFI bin, and it gets hauled away. So. Those bins, again, it's bulky plastic. If they can remove that out of there, the, their costs go down. So testing it on a few of these feedlots, as well as a couple dairies, hopefully get the message across and we can expand it further to more of them using it. But essentially all they need to do is fold the plastic into four foot bundles, four by four, put it in, you compress it down one time, manually lift it up, compress it a second time, tie it off with twine, six strands of twine, there's space in the bottom for forks, for equipment, forklift to lift it out, because that, that bale that is uh, four by four by two and a half feet, that weighs 560 pounds, that one does. So lifting it manually is not gonna happen. There's a bale kicker that we installed. It can all be run manually without power or other equipment. Um, so to put this visually in perspective, all that plastic in that little 42 by 42 by 31 inch bale, that filled a 10 yard roll off bin. We took a bin from Iron Springs that was brought in by the feedlots, which was the hand rolled stuff. So a 10 yard roll off bin is eight feet wide, six feet high and uh, 18 or so feet long. So that was all full and it turned into this weighing 566 pounds. So you can stick 
fill an entire semi load full of this and overweight the axle weight of the semi to get it to the recyclers. And our test loads have already gone to the recyclers in the province. There's two in the province that handle grain bags. One of them will take this. We have another market in the US that will take it as well. And so there is now a solution. The bale wrap, we're also working on testing, um, getting the bale wrap to compress it down, same thing. And so Lethbridge County is the, the, the pilot, the, the poster child for it. And that is it. Any questions beyond what's already been asked? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, on the to go back to the jugs and the bags, the bags are awesome. Uh, cool. As a producer, I think the bags are great. I used to always um, twine them um, just because I know the Lethbridge uh, or the Coldell site always appreciated that. But the bags are, are way nicer, uh, easier to handle. And I know the, the retail that I had, they would just give you an entire roll because they unfortunately they didn't have huge take up. But it worked out great for me, but a great product. I thought that was a really good um, change. Has I, I realize that you're focused on the plastic side of things. Has And I realize that we here in the county with the, the waste transfer sites, we do have some recycling capability. Has there ever been um, any thought given to possibly adding a cardboard element just because all those jugs we're bringing in come out of a box? Has there been any appetite to maybe entertain that I've always been a little hesitant myself um, I mean that's if we're talking about time and work breaking down boxes is way more work and a way bigger pain than dealing with the jugs is there ever been any thought to tying that together possibly I can start and you can finish <laughs> so yes we're constantly working on this so we actually have a, what's called a sustainable packaging committee which is with our members, so the, the folks that make the products, to find better ways of how to package everything so that we reduce the waste, first of all, that comes to the farm. So how can it be packaged differently in the boxes, the jugs, whatever, to make it more recyclable? Breaking down the boxes, I understand that's a challenge. In terms of the recycling, if they're clean, which they should be if you just take it straight out and you don't put an empty jug back in it, it can be recycled in the normal municipal um, cardboard recycling. But then yes, breaking down is a concern. Depending on the site across the province, some of them will take them unbroken down because they have a cardboard compactor. Okay. And so it doesn't matter. So it would be checking with, I don't know if cold, I know Iron Springs has a compactor, but I think that's for all their, their other big things like couches. Um, I'm not sure about the cardboard. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, just that the rec as long as it isn't contaminated, like the if you're punching the jugs in the chem handler and then putting the that's in the and that's I know I've I've done that in the, this year I really tried not to do that but I used to I would you, like you said you'd put them in the handler pop them and then throw them in the box and then I had a big cage that I would throw everything into but I always I never felt comfortable taking the cardboard into the you know to the municipal site then after that yeah municipal site or even the egg retailer so a lot of the egg retailers that you bought the product from um, will have some sort of a cardboard bin too for you to throw that stuff in when you're bringing back your jugs typically in Saskatchewan Alberta it's a municipal site. oh right right okay. sorry yes and then the other thing that um, clean farms at, at beyond our level is working on is decoupling the the surfactant with bleach or something like that so that um, the the you know the bigger boxes aren't so big anymore yeah. you actually buy the jugs separately. Well and the, the worst is uh, is your clethodim right it, it's your centurion your your grassy right those are the worst because you have three liters of, of clethodim with your amigo your adjuvant or whatever and they do 40 acres so you know there's so many. They're working on like she said, decoupling them so yeah. that you don't get so much of it. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 and maybe just uh, a second question, just to follow up on what Claus asked about the, the like, I know there's, there's work that goes into this, but I mean, I think it's the right thing to do, but I know other, you can't always convince people to do the right thing. So has there been any, and I know there has been conversation because I believe Saskatchewan, you mentioned Saskatchewan offers it, um, to incentivize, like for my 432 liter of, uh, Liberty, it's like, I think it's 500 bucks at my retail for the deposit. Is there, 
has there been any appetite to, to place deposits on the bags, on the silage wrap, on that kind of stuff so that we see more uptake? Or I, I realize that's a, a some murky water, but just a question. It's a good question because it, it came up, it, it's come up, you know, before regulation in Saskatchewan and all the way through. And now it's in you know, with regulation in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So um, the idea is to try and harmonize the, because the, the green bag, uh, first sellers are the same. So um, the the problem is is uh, when you when we did the calculation with having some sort of a return deposit system, is um, right now there's 25 cents a kilogram on every grain bag. Works out to be about 50 dollars a grain bag. So the producer does pay that. It's a visible fee, and they never see it again. In order to make that a return deposit system. The administrative burden of having that system in place creates almost a $75 environmental handling fee plus whatever the return deposit fee is. So say it'd be about $175 because it's just administrative burdensome. So um, the with every province, we do have these, these silos that operate. Uh, we're governed by boards an overarching board of clean farms plus every province, like we have the APRG in Saskatchewan, we have the SASC in Manitoba, we kind of blended the two together. They kind of oversee that and it can be different for province, long story short. Um, right now, it's a visible fee, environmental handling fee, one time and it's gone. To try and keep the administrative burden as low as possible. And then it's my job to try and reduce those fees over the course of the of year. And it does look like those fees will be reduced over time. So a, a deposit system costs more to the user, much more than an environmental handling fee. So when you pay for oil or paint or electronics, there's the environmental handling fee. If there was a deposit system, the environmental handling fee portion that you don't get back would be exponentially higher. So there's still that built in somewhere. When you look at a, <clears throat> like the bottle system, there's still someone's paying for the recycling. The, the money that comes back for the bottles that aren't returned does not cover the program. So like she was saying that it's 50 cents a bag, it would be, or sorry, $50 on average a bag, you'd add an extra 25 and then the deposit. So there's still, like it, it increases the cost and that's a factor that's now, provincially, though, if provincially, so <coughs> this is this is where we, we kind of would have a line drawn in the sand. So say in Saskatchewan, we plateau at 70%, and the regulation said you have to be at 75% by 2025 or whatever it may be. Then we have to start thinking, okay, how are we going to get that extra 5% of the material then we start talking about, okay, what is the cost of the program? How can we get more material? You know, seeking other options with one of those options being some type of return deposit system. If all of a sudden we have this regulatory goal that we have to meet by a certain date and we aren't meeting that goal voluntarily from, from producers, from voluntary programs, then we can start, you know, figuring out, okay, so this, we don't want to increase costs unnecessarily initially, if that makes sense. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just getting back to the cardboard, I know the last time I was there, they wouldn't take any boxes that came with a chemical in them, whether it was a herbicide or a pesticide or whatever. So I ended up having to take them home and burn them. Like, have they, they changed their mind any? Which, um, which transfer station? It was the one in Coaldale. Okay. Um, when was, when, how long ago was that? Not that long ago, actually. Okay. It could be, so it's how they, they manage them, and then it could be the transfer station attendant that was there. I'll, I'll check with them. We're actually heading to BBS today, so to find out. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. It varies across the province based on each site's managed by whatever organization, Waste Commission usually, um, and then a contracted service provider. So kind of their rules of how they collect things. It could be in the past that they've gotten so many, too many um, containers, uh, like cardboard boxes, 
that were just filthy and full of re residual pesticides that they're just like, no, we're not taking any. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's perfectly clean. Just no across the board. So that, I, I can't answer that, but we'll, I'll, I'll check for sure when I can get back to you guys. Any more questions or comments? Guess not. Well, thank you for your presentation. You're doing a great job of trying to reduce waste from our producers and by adding more and more things every year. So keep up the good work. Yep. And if any questions come up, you guys have my contact. I'm, like I said, in town. So I'm pretty yeah. easy to reach and can, can get you answers for anything of, and any of your, your constituents. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Motion for information. Anybody? Lauren, thank you. Call for the question. Those in favor? Carried. And we have Senator Pam Davison here, so we'll just take a recess for the time being. Okay.
Back at it, Gary. We are. Okay, the next on the agenda is G1, the South Region Ag Service Board Conference. So, South Region Ag Service Board Conference is held every year, of course, and uh, we go to go over the resolutions and, and keep involved with the South Region. This year, it is intended to be in Cardston on the October the 6th. And uh, of course, it's, that'll be up in the air, whether it's in person or uh, online. Any questions regarding the South Region Conference? What, what time in the morning does it start? Usually they start nine o'clock, but we haven't received anything. And I think uh, folks are holding off just to see on COVID and whether it can can actually happen. Are you five o'clock? Pardon me? Five o'clock maybe. Five o'clock in the morning? Then I can make it. So hopefully in a few weeks we'll have a little more idea what may or may not happen, I guess. And when I know I'll forward it through Ann yeah. to council and when we when we'll see who wants to go. Okay. Tori? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the time being would you still like this uh, the the recommendation that's here, Gary. Do you want to still go ahead with that for the time being? I think we can, or we can just add or have a virtual one like we did last year here in the office, if that's available. And then it's done with. We don't have to bring it back. Okay. I, I'd move the recommendation then, Mr. Chairman, um, that the ASB uh, recommend to County Council that any member of the Agriculture Service Board wishing to attend the South Region Conference in Cardston County on October 6, 2021, be permitted to do so. Thank you, Tori. And since it goes to council, we'll go through it again in whatever, two or three weeks probably anyway. So yeah. any questions or comments? Call for the question. Those in favor? Carried. And just a note um, on the provincial conference, I, I didn't mention that in my report. It's intended to be a live person event too at the end of January in Edmonton uh, at the Weston Hotel. I believe it's the 26th or something like that is the, is the start date. but. Everything's up in the air and everything is rolling out slowly. Okay, G2, the ASB Terms of Reference. So the Ag uh, Culture Service Board, we've created Terms of Reference and uh, uh, this is how the ASB structure is uh, structured and is to function. And it's going to replace a couple existing policies uh, that, that we've had. Uh, this is, uh, we've never really had a proper terms of reference on how everything is spelled out, on how many are involved, and precisely how our Egg Service Board runs. Uh, Jeremy did a lot of work on this one, and maybe he wants to speak as well. Yeah, just as per the, per the MGA, any standing committees of council, so the ASB board being a very important committee of council, has to have a terms of reference. So this was one of the ones that was identified as one of the committees that we have that does not have a terms of reference basically for guidelines and so on for the for the governance process. Is there any questions in regards to what's contained within? It's fairly straightforward as far as the layout and it's in a similar format to some of our some of our previous terms of reference. Um, very much it was we took the existing one for the emergency advisory committee obviously reworded it, rebranded it essentially to be for the ASB purposes. And I'll just uh, flow through it a little bit, touch on a few things. So the purpose is this is why agriculture service boards exist. Um, kind of lays out that it comes from the ASB Act. The scope, uh, the Ag Service Board Act uh, allows us to uh, have certain responsibilities. The bullet points there, that is straight from the Ag Service Board Act on our responsibilities that apply. And of course, moving down uh, the legislation that uh, enables us to carry out our, our uh, functions are the Weed Control Act, Soil Conservation Act, the Ag Pest Act, and to some degree, if there ever was an uh, animal health emergency, we'd be involved with that as well. Uh, so the official formation, it just says the legislation that allows us to form an Ag Service Board as well as uh, what the makeup of the Egg Service Board is. So our Egg Service Board currently is made up of all of council. 
and uh, also in addition it has the CAO the director of public operations and then m myself and and those uh, administrative duties are non-voting and I um, with the help of the executive assistant to the CEO, we schedule the meetings and, and set up all everything that you've seen here today. So the goals and objectives, that's just what our what we plan to do as an Ag Service Board. And the the governments, uh, it, governance rather, it's just a simple uh, moved or carried and it's gotta be four of seven, also four of seven to make a, a so you can have a meeting. Uh, authority and responsibility. So the committee is absolutely separate from council, so it, it can't do any of the functions that are intended for council. So there's only limited things we can do. That's why you see uh, many of, of the motions here are forwarded to count, county council. So if it was a separate board, I mean, that, that's how that would work. And then this terms of reference will be reviewed every five years. Seems simple enough, straightforward. Any questions, comments? Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, thank you. We've had this one before, haven't we? It, it wasn't specifically stated how th this uh, committee ran. Uh, we weren't able to find anything that stated that our committee was made up of all of county council. So this spells it out more directly. Uh, it'd be especially helpful for uh, new council when you're, you're how do things run well you can you can go through these terms of reference and, and have a better understanding thank you mr chairman i'd uh move the recommendation that this be uh moved to council for approval thank you dory any questions Seeing none, call for the question. Those in favor? Carried. And next on the agenda is the Ag Service Board level of service. Gary so and Jeremy, go ahead. So as well, uh, Jeremy and myself have been working on this for quite some time. A lot of work going into this one to just describing everything we do in a level of service document. Um, this document mirrors our Agriculture Service Board grant. so. We're obliged to meet the requirements of a grant and do the things as best we can that we said we would. So everything that we've done here takes into consider our ASB grant obligations. So the intention is is that we'll uh, create this document and then through budget, if things need to be added or subtracted, that's the time likely to do that. And this just gives us clear direction on what we're going to do and a clear understanding for council of what uh, our level of service is. So we'll move down to the actual document. I saw spray truck on the front. So the purpose and considerations of level of service, like we said, it takes into account what we do uh, regarding our legislated activities and what we said we were going to do. Uh, our scope of responsibilities, well, we're, we're ve basically vegetation management. We do mowing and spraying activity along with some parks and, and a few other activities, tree removal. So I uh, also do a little bit of work for transportation. So uh, what is the level of service? Well, it's the expectation uh, of our rural citizens and community that we have a standardized level of service that they can count on and if they need to to ask for something more that that's uh, comes through budget we just can't go on the fly our resolution of council that if we're going to do something that uh, more than we said we did we're going to do in, in the budget so now we get into the actual meat of it and uh, one of the uh, areas is delivery and support of the weed control act this is an area that is mirrored like I said in our Ag service board grant um, the bullet points here, weed notices, weed extension, leafy spurge, etc. those are all our policies that relate to the Weed Control Act and they're found in the appendix at the back of this, this document. So this is going to be the new form we see our policies. So every year when we bring this back, uh, previously I would review a policy one at a time and sort of carry them out through a number of years. It'll be easier to change those policies and, and bring it back for changes all at once once a year 
and then we're reviewing our policies every year as well. So our level of service measures in that area, what you're going to find, that's part of our Ag Service Board grant. It comes directly out of there. These are the things we said we were going to do. So this is a better format than the grant for sure. It's easier to read and it just states all we do and we're going to such things as having weed inspectors, uh, the amount of the municipality right away that will be sprayed. Um, you guys have heard me that we always spray a third. Every year it's going to be brought in front of you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question, Gary. Do you, which is two weed inspectors will be continuously appointed. So do you still have that one? Uh, we used to have that weed inspector who did a multitude of counties. You still have that person in place that worked in different municipalities as well as ours? We do not have that position anymore. So it was uh, a year ago, it was decided to a uh, number of counties didn't want to be involved anymore. So if you wanted to contract that person, you had to do it on an individual county basis. And the person that was doing that was to contact the counties and, and uh, provide a presentation on what he would do for you. He did not contact Lethbridge County to, to provide any services or give us any fees. So we don't have that one anymore. And the two weed inspectors that are continuously appointed by nature of my position, I am a weed inspector. So then we also have the assistant egg fieldman that is a weed inspector. We don't use him as much in that function as we have a, a seasonal weed inspector as well. So weed inspection isn't just during the season. Uh, we go to the seed compliance and we take samples and we're going through weed content. Uh, we get calls blowing kosher and, and things like that that we have to deal with as well. So you, you need somebody always available for, to do that work. So, and then the level of service, the measures there, that's just everything that I'm bringing back to the Ag Service Board me meetings and reporting on. That's why I'm reporting on all those activities because the government requires me to do that as well. So, moving on, uh, support of the Ag Pest Act. So that's the next act we deal with. A little bit less money there because we're not uh, intensive work. I mean, weed spraying brings lots of work. So there's all of our, um, policies that dealt with that from the from the Norway rat, coyote skunks, uh, pest surveys for the province. And then we get down, it's the same thing. It, these, these level of uh, measures from our grant states what we said we were gonna do. Moving a little further, the next area, it's the third act we deal with, it's the Soil Conservation Act. Budget amount here, usually not very much. We don't have to deal with soil conservation for as much as you usually. This year we'll be well over that with some of the contracts we're paying out and we're, we're just having to, to balance the budget, taking away from something to spend a little bit more here because it, it, it's, uh, there's been a lot of soil erosion. And we can, if uh, things continue, we can always change those budgeted amount and put in a more concerted effort. Next up, as we mentioned, uh, the Animal Health Act we deal with. So that one, we hope we never have to deal with, but uh, we keep uh, folks uh, up to date. We go to annual in-service training, and the reason is to be if, if anything should happen regarding an, an animal health uh, issue that we're, we're ready for it. There's no budgeted amount here, and if there ever was a, somewhere where we'd have to put money, it would, would have to be come in front of council is pulling from a reserve, I would imagine. Resource management, the rural extension program. Uh, this is part of our grant agreement as well. Uh, there's our level of service measures and I'll go through this one a little bit more precisely so you'll, you'll continue to have an understanding on that position. We do see, receive the 91,000 a year for this position. Uh, this year's budget amount was on 165,000. That's a low number uh, because of rural ex extension activities have been a little less with COVID for sure. But things are really starting to pick up with environmental farm plans and cap funding. So as well, it's the riparian areas we're worried about. Uh, we continue to work with the Old Man Watershed Council, cows and fish, um, with the, new, the newsletter, and we are working with commercial uh, manure haulers and getting that information out on their responsibilities on, on how to apply manure uh, properly as per the o AOPA guidelines. Moving down. 
Oh, and Gary. Um, so with the, the extension program, we did, last year we got cut uh, provincial grants on that one, is that correct? Yes, the, there was no money that come in for well past when they, they give it out and the, the program was really in question on whether they were going to continue. In the end, public pressure must, or something happened where they, they decided they were going to pay us for the previous year. So they paid us for that previous year and this year on this year's budget. So it's really skewed on uh, our budget's going to be, you know, we should have a surplus because, because of that. I think the general reduction you're referring to is from the primary ASB grant, which was reduced by 27 or 29 percent, from 160,000 yeah, roughly to 120. Yeah. yeah so um, with that, the county had to pick up the, the slack. We didn't uh, reduce any of our programs. Continue to do do all of what we said we were going to do. So roadside mowing, uh, this is the biggest function we do. There's, uh, com this is combined with roadsides, uh, hamlets. There's a number of mowing that falls into that to that amount, and uh, this is uh, part of our. Th this isn't part of necessarily our grant agreement. Mowing is outside of uh, weed control, but we use it as a integrated pest management, and a certain amount can be applied to the grant, but but not a whole lot. And uh, the value of mowing can be seen, of course, this year if you go down some of the roads that haven't been mowed and just the weeds that are, that, that are on them. I mean, mowing twice a, a year, uh, it, it certainly helps in our weed control efforts. Moving down to rental equipment. So just just one, one on the mowing thing, actually. The, uh, one of the reasons, too, that we do the mowings is for safety, of course, that people can see things, right? Like, especially by intersections and this and that. Have you noticed that uh, that we did it less this year, that there were uh, more, the weeds were, that there were or weeds or grass was that high that, you know, it could be, uh, could uh, implement and not, not to be dangerous and not, uh, not uh, that we didn't have it the same as other years? No, we, we've had at our level we've had the same. But just that the province is uh, provincial highways. I, I don't, I'm not sure of any data for collisions on that. But uh, if you drive uh, down our roads before they're mowed, you're driving down a highway. You can really see the traffic coming off onto the highway aprons, which is a big safety factor. I, I think it really, really helps for safety of, at intersections if when our gravel roads are mowed right up to the apron. You can see. You can see the traffic coming; like it's it's elevated almost. Some of that grass is four feet high, and the, what's how high is a car, right? So, no, it's yeah, because right. I did have I did have some inquiries of that from uh, from the ratepayers, yeah. So, regarding transportation or or ours? yeah, transportation and yeah. that uh, and and the county roads, uh, same thing. That uh, because it was a little bit later this year, I assume. That no, you started, or it just depends where no. you started, of course, right? So with that program, we we move it around. Uh, on the start depending on where our spray area is for that year. So our spray area being out in divisions four, five, and six, we stayed out of that Park Lake area that was part of our spray area. That's why it was a little bit later. Uh, people get used to our general program and where we run, roll through. Usually we start in one area and we roll right across the irrigated area, including Park Lake. So we had to leave that area for our spray trucks to control the weeds and what worked out really well is we sprayed it all before and then after it was mowed, that area in the Park Lake and in, in that area is, is some of the cleanest ditches that are in the county this year. Which, so our program's working on how we do it. So, And then moving on to rental equipment. Uh, so the rental rates are sked, uh, set out in our schedule of fees and then we will provide a list of the equipment and this will change somewhat. Some uh, of the equipment, uh, if we're not getting a lot of use, we'll sell it and, and maybe we're adding more as well. So that's in the uh, schedule of fees bylaw. Moving on to park cemeteries, hamlets and subdivision. Um, there's just a couple uh, policies involved in there and then we have our level of service. We like to get around our parks depending 
on the time of year, 10 to 14 day cycle times. Sometimes it's quicker if it's raining in June and then sometimes we get into July or August and you might do it once every two weeks and then net right now the grass is really slowed. So we also have a certified playground inspector. We, we go and inspect things monthly as well as the trail systems that are inspected and uh, we enhance and replace uh, some of the equipment at the playgrounds. Cemeteries, it's the same as you've seen in my report twice a year. As you can see from my report earlier, the correlation to actually what we're doing, and this is the reason. We, al we always had a, a set standard uh, level of service. Maybe you guys just didn't see it, you know, didn't see the whole picture here. So now we're, we're bringing that all together. So brushing, uh, tree removal, pruning, this is something the Ag Service Board is just uh, uh, is part of our of what we do now. So uh, we go around in the winter and we only remove any trees if they're a hazard, if they've blown down in the summer months. All uh, pruning and brushing that's done during winter months, and it's, it, it allows us to keep our staff on a little bit longer and keep them busy as well. And then number eleven is just what could cause delays in maintenance. Well, weather is the biggest thing. I mean, when you're spraying and it blows every day, this, this year was the slowest start to the spray season we ever had. Not a lot we can do about that. We're, you know, we fall, we got to follow the rules. Equipment breakdowns, well, we're pretty good there. We're running always optimal equipment. Uh, intense farm activity, uh, when there's a silage haul, potato haul coming up, mowers are moved around to avoid those, those uh, areas as well. As uh, well as emergency, uh, of the municipality or manpower storage, you know, COVID's brought these issues to light or pandemic. So just to conclude what we talked about, um, our level of service, that's a balance between the legislative responsibilities that we set out in our grant uh, and what with what the public wants. And then of course, council has to consider that and give the proper budgetary amounts. So, uh, and our report on all of our activities to government every year and what we do and we have to meet those we want to meet those requirements so we keep our, our budgeted amount for for both streams of funding so if you move down and, and finally is the appendixes all this is is all of our policies formed into one and you just follow them through uh, they're a little bit different format and we think the format works well that each year this can be brought in front of council as one entire piece for the Ag Service Board and, and, and the level of services. And then if anything needs to be changed, it's all front and center. And I mean, uh, like uh, you say, often you get public feedback on the services they want, and then that's what the time to bring this forward. It would be at the budget time, I would think. So pages 12 on would basically be the policy manual then sort of thing? It is the policy manual and this isn't a, 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 per, a perfect document yet. It's, it's our, our first go. So as we need to make everything smoother, that'll come. I mean, there might be a, poli a couple of policies that didn't fit and we may eliminate those policies. So, so this is the policies that are our main bulk of work. And you can see them here. They're just they're just formed a little different. It's the the exact wording. And Gary, what was your plan on you know working with this? And as you said, it's fluid. So would bring back in six months, or would you say a year, to kind of give you time to work through the policies and see how effective they're being? Just just a rough estimate. I would say um, we could look at this this winter, and then bring something back. Uh, in the, the spring egg service board meeting. Might be a good document to orient the new council as well. Yeah, this would be good for a new council because then they're going to have a better understanding of what we do as well. So, Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just a curious question. Why did you include the budget dollars in, in, a, in the document? Isn't that something that could change from year to year? So I, I, I just having a little trouble fitting the reason why they would be in there specifically outlined like you did. For each of the uh, for each of the level of service documents that we brought forward, the public works one including, um, we thought for consistency we should advertise what the budget is 
for each of the different tasks that we do within there because there is a recognition point that if the grants ever just same thing as the one grant uh, being potentially reduced we still have to decide like it's at the purview of the ASB board to essentially decide whether or not they're going to fund that shortfall or whether or not they're going to cut that budget for that level of service portion. So the budget is a good advertising tool and gives a good indication of what is our total value that we're putting into these specific activities. So you're putting close to a million bu bucks in right now? The total ASB budget overall is over a million dollars, yes. I, I, I just, I understand what you're saying. I just find it kind of restrictive in a way and confusing in another way because you're restricted to what you put in as a budget kind of because it's in your document uh, so I, I I guess I really don't follow the reason for it to be there Sorry, but, but isn't that you're you're saying chicken and egg the budget sets the number and then it's reflected in this document it's not that the, the budget doesn't have to follow what this document is the budget is still the budget right the budget is still the parent to this correct correct and so every year every year if that budget fluctuates it's going to be reflected in, in this document exactly yeah so I guess that's the reason I asked the question is if you have to change this every year is there is there a real value to it I, other than you're showing what you do but it the, becomes more complicated I think well, the, bi the big thing with any level of service document is you're trying to set a baseline for what your services are, and it's important for council. You know, it, it is a secondary budget advertisement, I guess, but you are bringing that back to council. If this is what council agrees to as far as a level of service, then that's also where we have to adjust our own internal budgets and make changes within those levels of service. So it... I think I understand what you're going to is it is a duplication but budgets are fluid to an extent as well so these will change year to year to year but that's also the intention of having this document is something that comes back before council every year so council sets that level of service then we can plan accordingly so after budget the spring ASB meeting would it would come back then more or less because it's the closest following the budget I guess correct yeah and and this still has to go to council for approval as well that's part of the recommendation within here now the budget advertised within here obviously if it was if it was changed or adjusted it would need to be reflected within this within this document because it will be essentially in some instances potentially almost a year behind or sorry not a year behind it will be predating essentially when we bring this forward in the fall of 2022 it would be a forecast of what 2023's budget would be essentially at that point staying consistent with the same level of services because we do have increases there's increases in uh, chemical costs those are things that we see on a trending basis as well as you know we're tied to union contracts and whatnot so there is an increase in the cost of the levels of service because of some of those smaller or some of those implements by any means though if council doesn't like seeing the budget numbers tied into this that is good feedback and that is something that we can remove from any of these level of service documents as well Does that mean that every department is going to have to have the same process then? Because when it comes forward, are, is every department in the county going to have a, a level of service document with their budget put in it again? Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm really lost as to why it has a budget component in it. I guess I'm, I'm really struggling with that point. 
For me, I think it's a correlation. Uh, if you're asking for extra services, there is a cost to that. So if you're getting pressure from citizens to do extra mowing, we have this and there's this is what we spend. And we can't really add because it, there, there is a cost to that until budget time. We just can't go adding services in any given year is, is, is what I think it's helpful for. Policies are forward-looking documents. Like all of our policies would be are advertised to the public and the public has access to that. So in part of our education of the public as an overall to when people are asking why. Well, we have a level of service. Here's our budget that we have allocated to that, which is approved by council. And that gives a basis for, you know, why we can't grade the road 20 times a year or why we can't mow four times a year. Here's our budget. This is our level of service that falls within that budget. That's what we can accomplish. If the public has a general feedback portion says we want mowing four times a year, then you have that's for us to bring or for you to bring to us as a request to see what that cost point is and then for you to approve accordingly what that cost increase is going to be to increase that level of service and then change that level of service amount within this document yeah i i i completely understand where you're going but it's just like it's just like being in the farming business it's no different because the weather drives what you have to do. Like if it's really bad weather, you may have to grade the roads twice as much as you do now. And the same with the, if, the, if we got enough of, uh, of, uh, of moisture, you may have to mow the ditches three times instead of twice for, for safety concerns. So I, I, that's why I guess I'm confused about the, the budget being part of this level of service because if you need to increase the budget, then we need to look at that separately. So I, 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 don't, I just don't see the purpose of it being here. Well, I think, I think you gotta see it this way, Lauren, in any way that uh, the, way, the way I look at it, you cannot just increase your budget there because I mean, all of a sudden you got bad weather and all of a sudden you gotta gravel your, say you gotta uh, grade your road so much more often. We don't have the equipment to do that. So I mean, we're gonna be, we're, 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 we, we have our, our line of equipment. We have like spraying and everything too. We can't do it any more than we're doing right now because we're, uh, we only have so, so much material to do the things. And that's why I don't see anything wrong with having this number in here. I think it's just, uh, this helps you along to see what, uh, what, what's going where, so. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm in, I like that, having a budget down there, and if it is an increase of budget needed, then that's gonna be explained, and, uh, and of course, council has to approve that, but then at least you have uh, a good uh, explanation in place down there to the ratepayer down there, hey, why did I go up, and then, well, instead of mowing twice, maybe we had to do it four times, and that's why, and no, I think it's a good thing to have. I think this document becomes an easier read for the public to read to rather than the budget. So if, if they are looking at level of service, they can see what each item kind of costs a little easier that way, I think. I think it helps hold staff accountable too, so they know exactly. You know, like in the past, we didn't really have a lot of level of service documents and it's hard to defend our judgments and our budgets to the public if we don't have this in place. And I think this document makes it easier and holds staff accountable as well. I only have this X amount of money to do mowing, et cetera. So I do think it's beneficial. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I think there's obviously some different feelings on this. I, I, I think I agree with the last couple speakers. I think it's, uh, it adds transparency. It, uh, it makes it clear to the public what we're doing and why we're doing it. It also explains why, you know, if we raise that level of service, there's a, uh, an attached budget increase that has to come with that. Um, I think it was probably a lot of work and I think it's great. It, it sheds some light on that and it, it's an easy to read document. It's pretty simple. Um, thank you. And so I would like to move the recommendation that this be moved to council for approval. Okay, thank you, Tori. 
So was that something that was mentioned it was going to come back in a few months or or more of the short shortly to council i mean we would probably look to bring this to council for the probably won't make it for the september 16th meeting but for the october i think it's, i believe it's october 2nd okay okay all right the date seven okay. october 7th okay any more questions or comments for gary or jeremy Seeing none, call for the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Carried? I would like to say how much I appreciate all the work that Gary put into all these policy documents over the years because these are mostly all written by him and to conglomerate all those is, is a large undertaking. So, well done, Gary. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, th <laughs> Thank, thanks for joining us today, Alan. Did you have any anything for us at all? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm just here to introduce myself uh, as uh, our local, your local uh, liaison. So uh, before this liaison program came into effect, we used to have the key conduct program, which you're all familiar with. The key conduct program, we had over 41 agronomists working with different uh, ASBs across the province. And you all know that the extension program and the research program is no longer. And so we are reduced to a very small number of uh, uh, different experts that are left and the government uh, thought that it is very important to still maintain connection with the, our ASBs. So they came up with a diluted form of the conduct, key conduct program which they referred to as the liaison, regional liaison uh, program. So um, one of the two, um, I have got 10 counties in the south that I work with and Joe Harrington is he's got eight. So in the south region, we have 18 ASBs. So I am your liaison. I almost say key conduct, but I am your liaison. So basically, in a nutshell, what I do is maintain working relationship with Gary and inform Gary what is going on on the government side and so he can report to you as an ASB or council. And uh, Gary is lucky that I work with the program, ASB program, so he can phone me and ask me questions that are way beyond the liaison program. So, and the way we have agreed to work, in most cases, most liaisons are doing virtually because of time limit, but because I'm local, I told Gary, if you really need me to come and see my see my friends here, councillors, I can come and they can ask me any question and I can update them on what's going on on the government side on anything including the ASB. And I'm actually impressed that uh, Gary came up with that uh, Thompson and of reference of ASB. I see a lot of progressive counties doing that and, and they try to incorporate that into their strategic planning of the ASB. And so that gives uh, the administrator, the Gary, the Ag Fieldman, uh, a guiding, uh, guiding principle uh, how he does his work and what he wants to target on the objectives, the targets, the measurables, and reporting. And from the reporting point of view, he, his report from 2020 looked pretty good, and that's what triggered the grants to come. Uh, unfortunately, we had a reduction of 27% on the legislation side and you guys got the most money on the resource management side. So on that note, um, Dale Krapko, who runs the resource management side, is eager to see you folks maintaining the same level of performance you did in the previous years. So I was just chatting with Gary here. Uh, after listening to what he said that Matt is working on, it looks promising and they should maintain 
the communication with Dale Krapko just to have that confidence because that one is um, merit-based program. We look at those who are performing the best and we give them our resources accordingly. So you folks and Red Deer are on the top. Any questions? Yeah. Where is dinner? Eh? Where is lunch? <laughs> I don't eat. Look at me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you need me to come and update you of anything, I'm I'm available. Yeah. Thanks, Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.